I heard that, but no one. Oh my God. I don't know if you remember me, Trish. I don't know why she keeps coming into the picture. Somebody else watching it, they didn't turn their camera around. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. We need to use that. Oh, the G or all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope it started at 11. There she is again. Good morning. Uh, please stand for the call of worship and then the gathering prayer. No, that's uh, in the church. Yes. Uh -huh. This is God's house, a holy temple. We are in the midst of God's dwelling place. My soul longs, yes, thanks for the courts of God. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Happy are those whom God has chosen to be here. Blessed are all whom God has forgiven and named. Our voices rise in praise of God's awesome beings. Mountains and seas bow down before the creator. God crowns the year with a bountiful harvest. Flocks and grain fill the meadows. God's presence is felt to the ends of the earth. All creation is God's fellowships. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Holy God, God be bless us with material, material provision and spiritual nourishment. Be pour out your spirit upon a young and old life. As we sing praise to you, O oh God, help us to see you with clear eyes. Help us to follow you with willing feet. And help us to be bound together by your steadfast love. These things we pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. And I join in the hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God, 356. <laughs> Thank you. 
words to gather, guide our giving come from 2 Corinthians 8, 7. That was you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in goodness, and in our love for you. So we want you to excel also in the generous undertaking. That's time for our last time. So in the center and in the back. Something happened to the... Huh? I thought something. Oh, children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God. Indeed. He has given the early rain for your benediction. He has poured down for your abundant rain. The early and the later rain, as before, the threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for your years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper. The destroyer and the cutter make my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people and shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am Good. in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, and your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you. 
Holy God, as we come to you in this place and time, <laughs> seeking your presence once again, we pray, mighty God, that you would pour out your spirit upon your people, that young and old alike would see visions and dream dreams, that we would catch the sight and sound what you are doing in our lives and in this world. Restore us to you, O oh God, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great ironies of the task of the prophet is that the prophet is called to bring God's message to God's people in season and out of season. Now, the ironic thing about that is that in the lived experience of most biblical prophets, this means that the message of the prophet is almost always out of season for the message for what those hearing their message would expect. In times of plenty, God's prophets were generally bringing words of judgment, warning the comfortable that they are failing to live up to the covenant promises that they have made before God to worship God alone and to care for the widow, the orphan, the alien, and the sojourner. And let's face it, brothers and sisters, in economic good times, how many of us are particularly receptive to the message that the source of our comfort and prosperity is built upon a house of straw? I know that for me personally, I would much rather hear that the happy times are here to stay when things are all well and good. Likewise, in times of hardship, the prophet often has the job of bringing a message of healing and hope found in God's promises. And while this message of comfort and hope is generally a welcome one in times of pain and affliction, Part of the message of the prophet is generally a re rejection of quick fixes. And let's face it, when the locust has destroyed all of your crops, or you have just lost your job, or your and your economic life, the last thing that you want to hear is that things will be okay in some distant future. I know if that was me, I can speak for myself personally and say that I would want to hear that things will be better as soon as possible, if not sooner. And even when we human beings hear what we want to hear, in times of struggle and pain, we often have great difficulty seeing beyond our immediate situation. The other great irony of these dual messages from God's prophets is that it is quite often the same prophet who is called to afflict the comfortable and then turn around yeah. and comfort the afflicted. The prophet Joel was one such prophet. <laughs> Outside of the book that bears his name, there is no other reference to him for his work in the Old Testament. And the only reference found in him in the New Testament is a direct quote of his words. His oracles are sufficiently vague that biblical scholars have trouble placing the exact time that his ministry took place or the exact situation that his ministry addressed. And part of this difficulty is that the two main situations of judgment both of which are found in chapter 1, the plague of locusts and the invasion from the north, were such common situations for the Israelites that without further specifics like who was bringing the invading army or who the king was at the time of the plague, Joel's words could have applied to numerous circumstances from the period of about 800 B.C. all the way up to about 300 B.C. 
So while this difficulty placing the exact circumstances of Joel's call and work provides a sense of frustration, it also speaks to the timelessness of God's words through our brother Joel. If one reads the book of Joel in its entirety, start to finish, I believe that you will come away with a sense of spiritual whiplash. Joel is not one for transitions, and when he does transition, it is so abrupt that you feel like you're on a roller coaster being whipped around the track with no control over where you are going. In rapid pace, Joel moves from affliction, asserting that the plague of locusts and the threat of invasion are because the Israelites have forgotten the covenant, to proclaiming that after these plagues, after this invasion, God's promise of healing and deliverance is once more there for God's people. And this sense of whiplash is exactly what tends to happen when the promises of God take root and surprise God's people. How often, sisters and brothers, in our lived experience, when God visits us, when God tends to our needs, when God brings transformation and change, do we not realize it until well after the fact? How often is it that we are so caught up in our present situation that it's almost as if we can't see the forest or the trees? Because God is already at work bringing about God's healing and transformation. The section of Joel that Sister Pam read today comes from this second movement of his prophetic work. As Joel turns to God's promises, he writes, O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain the early rain and the later rain, as before. For an ancient farmer experiencing the ravishes of a plague of locusts, followed by the pillaging of an invading army, the image of both early and late rains to bring about abundance would have been very difficult to wrap your mind around. When a person does not know where his or her next meal is coming from, it is hard to imagine feasting and plenty. When a farmer does not know how he will make it to the next harvest, it is easy to scoff at the images of abundance. Now, we do not know what the reaction of those hearing Joel's words was, because Joel didn't pause long enough to give them time to react. He plows right ahead, saying, The threshing floor shall be full of grain, the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. The promise of God is that those who have borne the cross of the locusts shall again know the abundant provision of God. Joel goes on to say, I will repay you for the years of the swarming locust deed, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which has sent against you. This is the heart of God's promise, that restoration that God sees and God responds. In that restoration, God not only promises that God is still there, God actively responds, God actively moves, God actively brings about deliverance, hope, and healing. And through Joel, God further acknowledges that it is God, not random chance, that is responsible for the devastation of the locusts, and that as a result of repentance, that it is God not the natural consequences of the locusts going away that will heal and will undo the damage that has been done. How often is it that the promises of God are at their most powerful at precisely the moment that they seem impossible by human wisdom? Why is it that at the very moment when circumstances seen beyond anything that could hope to be rectified, that the Lord our God chooses to act with vigor, with promise, and with power. Joel gives a hint of this earlier when he writes in verse 18, 
Then the Lord God became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. If God's goal in this cycle of sin and judgment and repentance and blessing is to break the cycle, to restore the people to God, and to remind them not only of the promise of God's power, but also of the power of God's promise, then God periodically needs to act to give that reminder. It is not that God does this for his own sake, but rather God acts to, to remind us that it is he, and not the idols that human beings so often both credit for blessings and blame for challenges, who is in control. And so John summarizes the powerful promise of God in verse 26, saying, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wonderfully with you. The heart of Joel's prophetic message is not only that the Israelites will have peace and plenty, not only that they will be restored to God, but that they will know beyond any shadow of doubt that it is the Lord their God and our God who is the author and perfecter of that restoration. If Joel were to have stopped here, his words would have fit the pattern that many of the prophetic promises of restoration establish. God hears the cries of God's people, God restores them, and then things are okay for a while. What sets Joel's vision apart from the other visions of restoration found in the Old Testament is that Joel sees a way for this cycle to break. Joel sees a way for the cycle of sin and judgment, repentance and restoration to no longer turn around with further sin. This cycle tends to repeat itself because complacency has a way of setting in to the human consciousness. And so Joel, with eyes of faith, sees the Lord our God acting beyond restoration. Joel sees the promises of God continuing into the future, writing, Then afterward I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men will see visions, even on male and female slaves in those days. I will pour out my spirit. God's ultimate goal, God's ultimate purpose in this restoration is not to fill the land with economic prosperity, even as wonderful as that is. God's ultimate purpose is to bind the Israelites to himself in a covenant which will forever break this cycle of sin. To do this, God promises that the charism of God's spirit will be poured out upon the entire community of people. Women and men will prophesy. Young and old will see visions. Slave and free alike will receive God's spirit. The promise of God is that the power of God's spirit will no longer be limited to a select few who are deemed holy. A select few who hold the office of priest or prophet or king. The entirety of God's people will have access to God's spirit. And why does God promise this? Why is God engaged in such a powerful and generous outpouring? Is it just to prove that God can do it? No, sisters and brothers, Joel hints at God's reason and purpose in verse 32 when he says, Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This generous and expansive outpouring of God's power and presence is promised, not because of God's vanity, but because of God's love. This generous outpouring is promised so that the entire community might be bound to God, might be restored to the covenant. And in receiving God's spirit, we all have access to the power of God's promises without another need. 
Restoration to God, therefore, is ultimately not about the abundance of our earthly store or the richness of blessings that look a whole lot like earthly wealth. Restoration to God is about the deep connection to the power of God's presence which manifests itself in the dreams, the visions, and the wonders which Joel foresaw and which Peter spoke about in Acts chapter 2. Sisters and brothers, what words of truth and prophecy have we received from the Lord our God? What dreams have the aged among us dreamed? And what visions have the young among us caught? This is the manifestation of the power of God's presence. The power of God's presence ties us to God and to each other. The power of God's presence leads us forward into a future that only God can imagine, let alone bring about. So let us dwell deeply into the restoration promised by our God, trusting that through the Holy Spirit, God will give us as God's people glimpses of that promise, promise tomorrow in the dreams, the signs, and the wonders that we receive, so that we might be spurned over, trusting in the leading of our God. And dare to follow where God has gone ahead of us. Amen. As we continue in response to the leading of our God, let us stand together and sing hymn number 418 of the Blue Hymn. Move in our midst. <laughs> There's not a place on here where we can give, is there? I haven't been here. I